Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. This morning, we're going to pick up with John chapter 4, verse 15. So if you want to open your Bibles there or bring it up in your electronic version, we will pick up with our studies there for here in just a moment. As always, we do have the verses on the screen. Hopefully, I make them big enough for you to read, especially if you're watching on your phone or something. If you ever find that the text is too small, in the live stream, let me know and I can always bump it up one as we go through the course of our study. Now listen, if you've joined us for the first time and you you are on our Facebook page watching this, then you can use the comment section, connect with this live video to let us know what you have to think, to share your thoughts and questions with us. If you are on our YouTube channel, then you can use the chat area connected with the live stream over there. And both of those are um, at Truth Factor Live. Um, at Truth Factor Live will be both Facebook and YouTube. Now, if you want to send your questions and comments to the, to us, you can do that to questions at truthfactorlive.com. We'd love to hear from you as we go through the course of our study. All right, gentlemen, it's good to see everyone this morning. We're having an interesting discussion about preaching methods and cross references and so forth. So, good little talk. Bob, you doing all right today? I am doing fine, doing fine. Finer snuff, but not half as dusty. This, <laughs> you know, um, Paul, you were talking about how we embed verses and everything. When I was a teenager, um, the con congregation where I attended in Jonesboro, Georgia, the preacher there, he had a Bible that had um, um, binding clips in it. There was three of them. So what he would do, and the, all the pages were, were individual pages, so you would unloosen it, print out his sermon on a dot matrix printer, stick it in there and retighten it so that his Bible laid open, but he was simply turning the pages of his sermon. He would put the verses in the sermon and everything. And you never saw him pick it up and walk around because it was obviously too heavy for that. But um, my, early my days. First days. My first days of uh, using PowerPoint were these printed transparencies that had post-it notes on them to reveal each point. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I miss the I miss the overhead projector days. They were cumbersome, and we have a lot more simpler now. But yeah, well, all across this country, in churches of Christ everywhere, there are uh, overhead projectors that no one would ever throw away, uh, <laughs> stored away. Bulbs are burnt out, but we still got to hang on to it. Well, when I first hey, started, I have a Gestet I have a Gestetner hand crank printer. Oh wow. Yeah. I'd love to find a home for it other than the <laughs> trash bin. But we first started preaching. A church that helped support me gave me an old thermograph. And so what a thermograph was, you would take a copy, and it had to be a copy of something. Inkjet printer wouldn't work in the early days. But you would take that, and you would take your, your thin um, transparency, lay them together, and run it through it, and it would burn the image onto the transparency. And then you'd kind of peel it apart there and everything. So, um, old, old tech. Speaking of old, we're studying in the Gospel of John. It's been around for a long time, but the message in it is just as applicable today as it was in the first century. We're in John chapter 4. We're going to continue in our discussion right around verse 15. But what I'd like to do to kind of get into this is first welcome everyone who's joined us. I was looking to look down, and um, we have Chris Kramer. With us today, Jimmy Kersey is with us. Also, Andy Walter, and let's see, Jerry Wilcox and Aline uh, Haynes and David from India is with us, and Marsha Patterson as well. Listen, if this is your first time, say hi, tell us where you're from, and um, if you have any thoughts or comments, drop them in there as we go through our study. We'll do our best to bring them in this morning. Um, why don't we pick up, what do you think? reading in verse 11 and let's go ahead and read down to um well let's read down to verse 24 it's not a no that's really too far let's start in verse 11 and let's read down through verse 18 no verse we'll do 19 that's a better stopping point 11 through 19. paul would you mind doing that for us 
Um, I, I missed uh, the chapter and verses that you wanted me to read. I'm sorry. Sorry, John 4, oh, 11 through 19. I can do that. Yeah. Uh, and I'll be reading uh, out of the English Standard Version today. Ooh, let me catch uh, John 4, that. 11 through 19. And so uh, this uh, reads as such. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. All right. Thank you, Paul. So we had left off last week uh, coming. We had studied up through verse number 14. So let's start there in verse number 15. When she says, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So she clearly did not understand what it was he was truly talking about, but this is the course of learning. Um, any thoughts about that before we start with verse 16? The, what Jesus does here sets up even more so to show her who, who he truly is. You know, she must have some concept in her mind, though, though a misconception, obviously, of what living water meant if she thinks, which it certainly seems she does think of a, a literal material water. In what sense would literal material water be uh, be living water? And I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if she's thinking that it is water that will uh, never run out like the uh, like the fish, fish and loaves that Jesus used to feed the 5,000. Uh, no matter how much water she drinks, she's always going to have this water uh, that it will stay full of whatever receptacle she has it in. But uh, just just a thought that I had about what she might have thought by, by, by about the word living in reference to literal water. Good thought. Any comments or thoughts about that? <clears throat> you know, just real, real quick, you know, b building on that, uh, she still has a materialistic concept. You know, uh, Jesus has to change the focus to a to a spiritual, which is what he's about to do. A and he establishes his credibility with that in verses 16 and 17. Yeah. And his That's answer. Important. Well, with that being said, let's kind of move into that section there. It, it is an interesting segue. For him to say, go call your husband and come here. So we, when we have conversations with someone, we can only know them as much as we have had experience with them. Maybe you might be an astute study of character, and so you can ascertain something about the individual, and it may help to lead you in a direction in a conversation. But Jesus knows everything about this woman. And so he says, go call your husband in the verse 17. She rightly says, I have no husband. What do you think about that? Do you think she meant that she was currently single? But that's not the case because he says, and the one you now have is not your husband. So any thoughts about why she would say that? I have no husband. She was not single in today's, in today's uh, parlance because... Okay. Today, if you've got a partner at all, you're not single. Single, whether you're married or, or just uh, shacking up or or whatever, uh, 
you're not you're not single but she seems to be saying that she has no legal husband no husband in the legal in the legal sense and so uh she's evading really the the issue by saying i have no husband to call uh, i'm not i'm not married uh may or may not be uh, in a, a, a physical relationship with someone, but, but not married. Yeah. You, you know, you know, tying into that, uh, I see the idea of, she knows her past, you know, I, I mean, the fact that she has had five husbands, I could see some, I could see some shame in that. And, and, and even Bob brought out the idea of hiding, you know, uh, more than likely, I mean, she, she answers the question as vaguely as she can you know, rather than acknowledging her history, because it's a, it's a shaded history. And again, Jesus uses this as an opportunity to give her reason to see credibility in him. Okay. All right. Um, I have broken my camera. (laughs) You've never looked better. (laughs) (laughs) So let me pull y'all up there. Good, you know, I was I was thinking about this just while John fi- figures things out. Uh, I was thinking about this, and you know, some people today have become, uh, by, maybe by observation, or uh, maybe it's a lack of teaching, or uh, just uh, the way our culture is, is they have come to see marriage as something that's uh, very unimportant, and uh, maybe they. Uh, they don't see a reason uh, to marry. And so here, maybe even in in this ancient culture, uh, or if you would consider this ancient, uh, that maybe she's saying, well, uh, I've been married five times and that didn't seem to work out. And so uh, I'm with a man, but he's not my husband. Uh, And maybe you guys are seeing that a little more uh, theological uh, as far as her answer goes, a little more uh, in regard to divorce and remarriage and things, but I think maybe she's just like, uh, no, I, I, I tried that and I tried it again. And I tried it five times, and uh, this is uh, not not worked out for me. And and so maybe like a lot of people today, uh, that it's not unusual to uh, hear people say, um, you say, how how long have you been married? And they'll say, well, we've been together. Uh, for 10 years, but uh, for the last five, we've been married. And that doesn't mean that they were just dating, generally speaking. It doesn't mean they were just dating uh, for that period of time. And so I I, I don't know if uh, maybe she had become Mm -hmm. kind of uh, jaded or lost her belief in the importance of marriage uh, or not. But regardless, it's pretty common of our culture today to see people uh, like that. And it's not uncommon to see even for folks to say, um, well, we had uh, three children and then we got married. And so, and they were, they're part of the ceremony and everything. And it just, it's just in, in doing that, it's just viewed as a normal uh, everyday kind of thing that this is just, just how it is. And I think maybe she's, and, and this is a maybe, I, I hate to be that way, but maybe that she has just come to um, lose any respect or see the importance of uh, marriage in general. So I don't know. You guys tell me what you think. He's given up on the institution. <clears throat> well, okay. C- a couple of things considered. First off, um, since she was from Samaria, if, if they, <clears throat> they worshiped in Garism, because that's where they believed based on the first five books where they would have, so if there were any any laws pertaining to the marital situation there, um, it could be her husband's died, although it doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, it specifically kind of suggests otherwise. Maybe they didn't like her. Remember, that was part of the law. If a husband signed, finds some measure of impurity about you, he could put you out and give you writing divorcement, go to another. Um, but all that, you know, could be the situation as well. Um, it could come back to what y'all were talking about. Uh, Marsha Gray Patterson in our chat room 
She says she probably felt stuck at a place in the relationship where she was filled with so much guilt. It could be that as well, where after so many times and respecting maybe a little bit, Jesus in his mannerisms, the way he was teaching, though, you know, just in general, she may have felt a bit of guilt and that's why she said what she said there. Um, but a lot of different ideas. I, I think it's interesting though, that she would have been guided by, depending on how closely they adhered to the, uh, the Mosaic law, you know, they would have been guided some respect by that. Um, but what is interesting you know, about this, or go ahead, Brian. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, you know, one thing I always like to point out, I think is really interesting here in this passage. Um, imagine any of us sat down with somebody who said, Hey, I'm kind of interested in what you guys are talking about. And you and I were the ones that, ha that came to somebody and said, well, you know, we know that you've been married five times and that currently you've got, you're living with somebody and that's not, you're not married to that person. I think most of us know what kind of reaction we're going to get from somebody. If we said something this up front with somebody, nine people out of 10 are going to, how dare you? You know, you you have no right to judge me. You don't know what my life was like. And, and they'll storm out. One thing I've always thought was fascinating about this woman is that she seems to be a person of unique character. And I, and I have to believe, of course, this is why this conversation is here. Yeah because we're getting the one in a hundred or one in a thousand that doesn't say, how dare you judge me? That says, you know, I bet you're a prophet, you know, which is going to be kind of neat because she's not going to say, uh, how do I fix my life or something like that? She's going to say, Hey, the big question is where do we worship? Can you tell that one to me? She, we haven't got there yet, but that that's going to be her big question. There's something about this woman is special. Um, because I've never had a conversation with somebody and I've had these conversations. These, all of us have had these conversations where been married before, have you, you know, um, well, do you know what the Bible says about that? And, and, you know, I've had them storm out yelling at me, crying, whatever. I've never, I, I don't think I can say I've ever had say, oh, well, that's what the Bible says. Well, that's, you know, good to know. So this woman's reaction shows she's something special. She isn't mad at Jesus or having pointed something out, she realizes that he's speaking from a place of authority or of, you know, in, the, in this case, the authority is she kn he knows things about her that he couldn't possibly know. In fact, that's what she's going to tell the people later, yeah. right? She'll say, he, he knew things about me nobody could know. Um, so, so I just love, I like to point that out about this woman. Why is this woman going to be special enough to get this special message? Ultimately, she's going to save her whole village. Well, she is a special person. She is she is that kind of person that the gospel is best suited for. Somebody who can honestly look at themselves and say, yeah, I've, I've done some bad things. Sure would like to get that right, though, as opposed to I've done some bad things and you're not, you know, to judge me yeah. for it. Um, and I, I really like to point that out, that there's something special about her response that is not typical. It's, it's more somebody who is a truth seeker who, who has a love of the truth. It's almost as if he, he, she already knew this. What he's about to say to her. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Or uh, Bob. Say to me, Jesus says nothing here that can be construed as judgment. He doesn't say you're not married. He said, go bring your husband. Go get your husband and bring it. He leaves that open-ended for her. And to me, he's eliciting from her, her situation. Yeah. And so... She's not mad. She has no reason to be mad because he's just assumed in her mind, he's assumed that she's married because he knows she's not. But she said, well, I have, I have no husband. So he's just made a statement and she makes a statement and there's so no, so there's no real back and forth here or any kind of argumentation uh, whatsoever. And so when Jesus says, yeah, you're right. You, uh, you have no husband, but again, he's just stating the fact. No, he's not, he's not, there's no judgment here. Uh, you have well said, I have no husband. You have had five husbands. So that's a matter of fact. And the one whom you now have is not your husband and that you spoke truly. And so He's just basically confirmed what she said and added to that information she has not shared with him, but that he is private to because 
uh, because of who he is. And, and I think that dawns on her that he knows more about her situation than, than she has conveyed to him. That's a good point. I think it's a good point. Yeah. You know, and Bob, what's interesting about what you said, you know, he's just stating a fact, you know, it's interesting. I've, where I've seen, you know, where I, one of the times I've had people storm out in anger is I had said, well, let me show you what we teach about marriage. And I just read Matthew 19, and, you know, uh, the portion Jesus taught and they, they stormed out in anger, you know, over that. And so again, you're right, Bob, it is, he's just stating a fact, but it certainly is, is going to be interpreted by a lot of people as a matter of judgment. you you know, you, you know what, I know you're not married now because you've had five husbands. They're going to, a lot of people are going to, you know, say, how dare you? But you're right. It's just a statement of fact. And he, and of course, you know, we don't really know what all he said to her and the others that uh, came with him. We just have basically a summation of it. And so eventually I'm confident he does share with her what the scriptures say, what the law said about marriage and divorce. Yeah. But this was a great opening to me. And, and I think that's one of our, well, one of my weaknesses anyway, is uh, how to get a good opening with someone to study the Bible without insulting them or making some sort of judgment uh, regarding their situation uh, that might tend to offend them. And, and as, as Brian pointed out, yeah, eventually when we get to the Bible, some, some will be offended, but we can't help that. Yeah. Maybe we ought not to just jump into like baptism. I think too many times we jump right into baptism when we really need to talk about faith and, and repentance and confession. Yeah. And somebody says the hardest thing uh, to get somebody to do is to be baptized. And somebody else says, no, the hardest thing is to get them to repent. If you can bring them to repentance, uh, then you could, you probably, you, you could probably baptize them. You can teach someone, you could talk someone into being baptized without fully yeah. teaching them. And, and that's, yeah. That's not good, you know. Um, I knew a preacher years ago, we kind of differed on the subject of how you approach someone. And his approach was essentially, you go knock on a door. If someone comes to the door, you say, where do you go to the church? And they say, I go to ABC denomination. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you're going to hell. I'd like to come in and study with you. You know, it, that's not teaching Bible. That's right off the bat, turning them away from you unless they're a combater. Some people love to argue. You know, and so they would say, okay, come on in, let's have it out. But you got to teach them the word of God and get to that point. And this is a great example um, what's going on here. What other thought, a... uh, uh, let me, let me share this, Bob, and then I'll get your thought real quick. And we got a comment. One of the thought is, is an interesting commentary on the teaching of the law regarding marriage, divorce, the mosaic law you know, what all it allowed, but yet you look at what Jesus concludes that she's on her fifth husband and he's really not her husband. But anyway, go ahead, Bob. I was just going to say that there was a fella in Alabama who was very good at convincing people to be baptized, but mm -hmm. he never talked about the Lord's church. He didn't talk about him. He talked to him about repentance. And so he would baptize them, but leave them where they were. Yeah. in whatever religious group they were in. And, and he felt like he was accomplishing something because he was getting people baptized. Well, if, if that's all that you're doing, then they're going down dry centers and coming up wet centers, uh, as they, as they say. And so, and, uh, we need to prepare yeah. them for baptism instead of jumping right into it. And it supports the notion, the belief that we believe all you have to do to be saved is be baptized. That's right. It supports that. It's not true, but yeah. Okay. That's a lot of, a lot, a good rabbit trail to go down, but we got a couple comments I want to bring in. Jimmy asked a little bit earlier, so this will be a little bit late, but we're still in the section. He says, could the author be using this as a metaphor um, of some sort? He definitely, John's using it as a teaching tool um, in conveying this event within the life of Christ. And then, um, Marcia makes the point that Jesus also spoke from the point of love. 
And that's, that's a, a very, very good point there. And then we'll bring in Jimmy's next comment real quick. He says, this also shows how much faith this woman had to have. Could she be used and added to the wall of faith in Hebrews 11? I mean, Hebrews 11 was written by inspiration, pulling people of old in their great faith. It's interesting who was not included in Hebrews 11 within that list there. But I think anyone who stands before the many cloud of witnesses and walks faithfully before the Lord falls within that great list of the faithful. Yeah. Um, any thoughts or comments about those before we bring in uh, James Dodson's comment? Okay. okay. And then real quick, he says, this is from Acts 26, verse 19. Then, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Then verse 20. But declared first to those in Damascus, Jerusalem, and through all, throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. That goes back to the very message that was presented um, by John the Baptizer, and then the, his disciples, and the disciples of Jesus. Repent, therefore, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's the very message that he presented, do works fitting for repentance. Yeah. All right, any thoughts or any comments? All right, so let's continue forward here. So this conversation definitely causes this woman to think about who Jesus is. And there in verse 19, she makes a statement there, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So this prompts her then, um, Tom, to ask an interesting question about worship. And this was probably a big question for their time period. Do you worship it? Jerusalem, or do you worship at Grism? Yeah, any thoughts about this? Definitely an interesting question, uh, you know, uh, from that standpoint. Uh, she knows Jesus, uh, she knows Jesus is a Jew. And, and so she's bringing up the, qu the, the, uh, the question. I've, I've often heard it stated that uh, maybe she was deflecting deflecting from what Jesus had said to her about her relationships and so on. You know, hey, Tom, uh, let I, me, prophet, let me interrupt you for just a moment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I made a major oops. Would you read for us? I just was oh, reminded yeah. we, we haven't read this section yet. So, and then we'll come sure. back to what you're saying. Let's start in verse 20 and let's read down through verse. Um, let's go through verse 26 there, if you would, sir. All right. Okay. Uh, you know, again, that verse 19 was, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what, or we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. All right. Thank you, Tom. All right. So let's go back then to what you were saying there. Um, if you remember, sorry about interrupting you there. Um, yeah. Your thoughts there about verse 20 and um, her perception of Jesus and to, to prompt her to ask this question. Yeah, I, I, I was making the point that, you know, uh, that it there's a sense that I've heard people say that maybe what she was deflecting from what he had said about her personal life, you know, you know, I identify and I know, I know your, your, uh, uh, relational, uh, your relational circumstance. I, I, I know, I know everything about that. And I'm not saying she wasn't sincere in saying you are a prophet. Obviously, you know, obviously that, that was implied by the fact that he was able to tell her, even though he didn't know her. And I'm not saying there wasn't a curiosity about <laughs> uh, uh, about what she asked. I mean, I think it was something she genuinely wanted to know. But you can't help but wonder, is it a deflection 
from the topic or is there a part of the or is there a part of the conversation that is not recorded in the text because you know what we have recorded uh, is uh, the condensed version of conversations in many instances yeah. you know so uh, from this yeah. and so that's what I kind of see as the background and of course Jesus uh, use it as an opportunity to teach. I mean, he wanted to get her into a spiritual conversation anyways, as we, I think I talked about this last week, you have here the great example of turning something physical into a spiritual conversation, which is really what we ought to be trying to do. You know, if you want to teach somebody, uh, you know, start at a, start at a place where they're at and find a way to transition that. And, and Jesus does that. And he, takes her spiritual request, her spiritual question, and he uses it to introduce the truth of the gospel and what's going to happen. And of course, that leads into the actual conversation itself. So we, we oftentimes want to overlay the way that we would behave on these situations. And if we kind of do that, I'm looking at her and, and if I'm having a conversation with Jesus and realize he's a prophet, I'm like, hey, I got this question for you. Yeah. that we've yeah, been discussing there, back yeah. at home, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, um, and, and it's both, uh, and it could be both of those. It could be both, so, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It could be the deflecting and opportunity to get it clarified. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any thoughts about that? Go ahead, Bob. I just, I don't see it as deflecting because of what follows later. Uh, that, you know, she goes into town and she brings all these people. But she has perceived that Jesus is a prophet. And this gives her a great opportunity to find out just who has been worshiping God in the right place. This is probably something she's wondered all her life, that her ancestors have said, no, we worship in Gerizim, but the Jews, they worship in Jerusalem, but we're God's people. And I think Brian may have brought this out more last week about the 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 Samaritans really thinking they were they were God's chosen people, and uh, so I've got a prophet here. All right, mm -hmm. our fathers worshipped on this mountain. You Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where we're not to worship. She doesn't ask the question, but it's an implied question, or at least if she asked it, John does not record it. But there's certain he certainly implies, it seems to me, that she wants to know whether she and her people are worshiping in the correct place or whether the Jews are worshiping in, in the correct place. And so I don't see it so much as, as deflecting as here's something that's been on her mind for years. Here's a prophet. I'm going to ask him. Right. Hey, you, you know, and, and, and John, I know you got to deal with something in the comments, but, you know, on, on what Bob said there, how many of us I, I would love to sit down with Jesus for five minutes and get clarity on some subjects? Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I, I mean, I mean, and, and you've got that as an idea here. Yeah, I mean, you know, where where's the right place to worship God? You know, who's who's got the truth? Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could sit down? How, how many brotherhood issues could we clear up? And, and, and probably the answer is not as many as we think because because uh, peoples have their minds set. And if they didn't like the answer, uh, uh, they'd want to nail them to the cross. Uh, uh, but um, but I would love to have five minutes to, yeah. to just ask some questions. Well, here's what would happen. You would have brethren saying, well, Jesus told me this. Well, I talked with him and he told me this. And I really think he meant this. And I don't yeah, think he really uh, meant yeah, what yeah. he said to you. He meant something yeah, else. And, yeah, 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 exactly. Or but what about? Yeah, but he has, he has already talked to us right. through his yeah, word. Right. And we see how people behave, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, have you ever talked with anybody who uh, it almost seems like if they get to heaven and they find out they're wrong, they're going to challenge them to a debate? <laughs> They're going to challenge, no, you know, never. To, <laughs> never yeah. seen anyone like that. <laughs> right, yeah, anyway, anyway, get back to the comment, yeah. John. So um, would, I've got a it, comment. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to, to finally uh, 
find out whether Brian or I are right about to get to the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are so many positions on that. Uh, we probably won't all understand until we get to heaven. Uh, what if, though, it matter. <laughs> what if you got there and Peter goes, well, you're both wrong. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so in the comments, real quick, uh, Michael Davis, he used to be a part of this this merry band of men, and um, life has gotten him busy. But, Michael, it's, it's good to have you um, in our uh, back in our study with us today, at least in the chat room. It's good to see you, brother. Gregor said, and let me bring this one up here. So there we go. Wrong button. Gregor says, balancing truth and feelings is difficult. Our culture, as in the U.S. culture, accepts the idea that feelings are truth. Scripture tells us self-control is a gift of the Spirit. It's a good point. You know, it's a good point. Um, the, the application of the Word of God must begin within our heart. And we cannot confuse that with feelings that we may have. It's, it's, it's got to be the guide for them. It's... It's a very good point and a very, very good discussion we could have. But Brian, you commented specifically to that. And if you want to read your own comment in your own voice. <laughs> well, I was just telling Gre Gregor, I really like that comment because uh, it's a good example that, you know, uh, are you are you a person that makes your choices on your feelings? Or are you a person that makes your choices based on I'm a truth seeker? Um, I might have got, if I was in this situation and Jesus's comment to me is, well, Brian, I know about your bad habits. I know about the things you've done wrong too. Might have got my feelings hurt. If I'd been married five times and like I said, we're kind of assuming she means married and divorced five times. Um, and Jesus says, you know, Brian, uh, I might just kind of either get angry or just kind of, you know, like the rich young ruler walk away with my feet, you know, sad, uh, whatever it might be, I might've got there, but she instead turns and says, oh, you're a prophet. I got some questions for you. Um, th there's not many people like that, but that's a person. Uh, and hopefully every listener that we have is that person who says, oh, I, you know, I, I, it's not about getting my feelings hurt. It's about finding truth. And I got you. Well, I've got you here. If you're a prophet, here's the big one, you know, and I like the way Tom said it. Um, and, and if it's okay, I want to make a comment that mm -hmm. moves us ahead too. how shocking it must have been. Jesus's answer, because what she's looking for is for him to say, well, it's Jerusalem, you know, or, well, you could be right. It's charism. And he says, well, let me tell you, the time's coming. We're not going to worship on any mountain. Um, you talk about I was looking for A or B and Jesus gave me the answer of 37. You know, it, it, it's so different than what she was looking for. You know, I wish I could have been there in that conversation. I wish you could see your look on her face when he says, well, yeah. actually, we're not going to worship on any mountain because God isn't worshipped on a mountain. God is worshipped in spirit and truth. What? I, I mean, it's just incredible to think about how different an answer Jesus gave her. Yeah. Brian, do you point. think uh, in verse 22 that he, he does answer her question? Uh, so he says, yeah, well, I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Jerusalem's the right place. But yeah. here, here's a much more important truth that you need to know. And so, and that is that uh, talking about the true worshipers. Uh, and so, uh, but I, I think it's nice that, I don't suppose it matters if I think it's nice or not, but I think it's nice that Jesus does actually answer her question uh, that it, well, yeah, Jerusalem's the right place, but here, here is uh, something you need to get that's much bigger than Jerusalem or uh, on on that Samaritan mountain or anything else. Here's something much, much more important. Hey, hey Paul, you know another way to say that? Um, Jesus makes the point, Jerusalem is the right place, but there's a time coming where you are included. Yeah, I like that, Tom. Good job. Um, In other words, it's going to matter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to matter whether you're on a mountain or not, no matter, not just which mountain, but whether you're on a mountain or not. But this is something I've found uh, sometimes in having a Bible study with someone who's not a Christian. Uh, people come up with the most bizarre questions, uh, and I think it's good. You don't have to answer that question in the moment, 
But just to, uh, I usually take out a notebook and put their name on the front of it and say, well, here's a question you have. And we're going to answer that question. But right now we need to talk about more important things. But we'll come back and we'll answer that question. If there is a Bible answer to be found, uh, we'll find it and we'll discuss that. Maybe not in, in this moment. So, yeah. And Jesus yeah. does that. He answers, he answers her question, but then he tells her the more important thing she needs to know. You know, it is interesting, the, the distinction, almost contrast between what he says as recorded in verse 21 and what he says as recorded in verse 23. In verse 21, the hour is coming. But in verse 23, the hour is coming and now is when you shall neither in this mountain, uh, when you, uh, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeking such to worship him. That has, that has always been true. <clears throat> that is not something new to the New Testament. <clears throat> the New Testament, at the time John, well, at the time that Jesus is speaking here, the New Testament is not in effect. Uh, but there's only a short time left in this in this uh, dispensation. That's verse 21. But in verse 23, it's always been the case. Uh, God is seeking those who worship him in spirit and truth. And so I, I, I think there's an interesting distinction there. Uh, changing from the place and the fact that it won't matter to the nature of the worship itself and why it won't matter. You know, and I think she kind of gets that because verse 25 that when he says is now here, I don't think she takes that as this very moment it's here because she says in verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. Yeah. And so she seems to, in whatever lingo or idiom, uh, of the language they were speaking, she seems to get that the idea is uh, it's it's urgently approaching rather than it is actually right here now. So that's right. the new covenant, that's right. But it's always been truth and spirit. Yes, always. Joshua told the people sincerity and truth, which I take it as the same thing as spirit and truth. But yeah, she's she's anticipating. And that's another thing. The Samaritans are anticipating the Messiah. Yeah. Every bit as much as the Jews. It seems here. At least she is. Yeah. That's right. Um, real quick, um, although we're, we're, we're kind of past the point, but Michael had shared in the uh, Facebook side of the world, Tom's answer. This goes back to, again, what we're talking about probably five minutes ago now. Is from Second Peter three verse one, and just kind of bringing that up here real quick. He said, "Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder." You know, talking about the word of God being preached and taught and given to us. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Let me get back here. A, a lot. You know, there is really a lot here that we could uh, we, that we could unpack. That really time won't permit. And I think for the purpose of our study, we'll move forward. But one of you commented on the fact that he does answer the question about where to worship, at least currently. You know, when he says, you worship what you do not know, we worship, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But I like what Bob said, though. He says, when he talks about the hour is coming and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father, Spirit, and Truth, this has been from the beginning, hasn't it? We, we can't say, can we, that this is now part of new covenant, that now under the new covenant of Christ, God wants people to worship him in spirit and in truth. I think he's always desired people to worship him in spirit and in truth. It's kind of like loving him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. People say, well, the old mosaic law was all physical. No, it was spiritual. It was, it was from the heart. It needed to begin and to originate. And, um, yeah, that was that is such an old saw that I have heard over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was physical, but now it's spiritual. It was by works, but now it's by faith. But Hebrews 11 shows that 
from yeah. through the patriarchal and mosaic age it was, it was faith uh, That's right. that had to move you to obey god and absent faith nothing you did would accomplish anything even under the law well how many sacrifices were offered in vain because the people weren't worshiping the Lord with their heart. They weren't serving him with their heart. Yeah. All right, let's see. We could also spend time talking about the fact that the worship must worship in spirit and in truth, and kind of what that means. But I think it's pretty well self-evident. In part. John, could I make a comment on that? I know you want to move on. Um, no, you're, I just you're want good. to say. Because of our time. We are actually nearing the time that we need to end, so there'd be a good point to start wrapping it up. And Brian, you're the good rapper, so have at it. But we started That's right. The rapping preacher. Um, <clears throat> so you know, spirit and truth, as Jesus describes it here, I, I hear a lot of people say, "Well, I think spirit means this, and truth means that." Um, and it's not to be too critical of those opinions, but one of the things I think is important to understand is that the Book of John actually defines spirit and truth. Um, we're not meant to say, well, I think spirit is this and truth is that, you know, um, and I, I myself have done that many times, um, till I realized that John actually explicitly and specifically defines both of those words, uh, later in the writings that we're supposed to uh, tie back to this. So in John chapter six and verse 63, Jesus is going to say, my words are spirit and life. My words are spirit and life. In John 17 and 17 Thy word, your word is truth. So we're we're not meant to just say, well, I think spirit is, and you know, I've said all sorts of things. The spirit is the revealed word of God, the truth of God. Um, and we might say for a second, wait a second, it sounds like spirit and truth are kind of the same thing. Yes. Um, explicitly the Bible says that a number of times. I think what is it, first John four and verse four, spirit or first John five, or spirit is truth. Um, they're they're not two things where there are contrast, which, which I myself have sometimes said, John defines spirit and truth as both being the word of God. You know, we will do things according to the word of God. And so there's a, uh, there's a concept here that we're not, you know, we're not, we're not left to uh, say, well, here's what I think it means. John is specific to define these words for us. So we'll have a good definition again, John six and verse 63, John 17 and verse 17 both of those are defining verses that define it. That's a good good explanation of that, Brian. Yeah, you'd be it would be prudent for you to maybe drop some of that in our chat room if you get an opportunity to. Yeah. It's a good explanation. Yeah, you know, it's, after all, you know, we understand and again, this is John, John's gospel. Uh, um the spirit is our source of truth. I yeah. mean, I mean, how often, right. how often is that emphasized? So, if you're worshiping, if you're worshiping God in spirit, you're following the directions of the spirit. Uh, of course, the debate is: is this saying that our worship needs to be both true to the Word of God and the word "spirit" is not so much the Holy Spirit as it is our attitude, which is kind of the approach that we we give to this yeah. verse. But he does say God is spirit. Yes. And based on that word, those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Hard to believe that the two words aren't connected there within the thought process. Exactly. You know? um, yeah. Interesting point. Any final thoughts? Um, we didn't quite talk about verse 25 and 26, so we could do that next Thursday. Kind of step back to verse 25 and look at that and then get into... Uh, the next section there. But any, any final thoughts on this as we pull to a close? I just, I just want to say that I can see that spirit, because God is spirit, our spirit has to be involved in worship. Uh, and and that is, I don't think that is yeah. in contrast at all of what, of what Brian says. We worship in spirit and in truth. It is it is we who worship in spirit and in truth. Spirit is a matter of the of the spirit, even as spirit and truth there do not refer to the human spirit. Uh, we still got to worship God with the entire inner being. Yeah. Uh, heart, uh, heart, soul, mind, and strength, as Jesus said. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, real quick, Jerry shares a thought. He says, the words are important 
the intent is also important and he uses as an example uh let's see matthew 23 23 what do you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice mercy and faith these ought these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone so it's a good point jerry very very good point all right well we appreciate everyone joining us today we've got as we said marcia jerry um and others james michael and gregor we all said jimmy and uh, others we mentioned oh chris others started the show we appreciate you joining us today and maybe this is your first time joining us for our bible study we want to thank you for your interest if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to email us you can send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com or if you didn't like what tom said in particular you can write him tom at truthfactor.com you know or, or if you thought bob just was outstanding in his analysis of things you could say great job bob and send it to bob at truthfactor.com <laughs> And if you don't Tom, like what Tom said, you can write to Brian about it. And all yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we're both in agreement. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Send it to Brian. <laughs> Should I make an email that just says general dislike at truthfactor.com or gossip at truthfactor.com? We could do that. And you could send us the gossips about one another. <laughs> all righty. Well, let's plan next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time to continue our study of John chapter 14, we are going to pick up with right around verse 25, I believe, and then we'll continue John four, sorry, John chapter four. We'll pick up right around verse 25 and continue there in the chapter. Listen, I want to thank you so much for joining us for our study this week. And Lord willing, we'll see you back here again next Thursday. Check us out on social media, Facebook at Truth Factor Live and YouTube, Truth Factor Live as well. Y'all have a great week. Bye-bye now.